All right, y'all. Well, since we've got a lot to talk about and a lot of people to hear from, I don't want to delay us any further. So we'll get the show on the road here. Um, so, uh, so appreciative of everybody who's joining us this evening. My name's Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, tonight, we're really excited to host contributors to uh, this book right here, Rattling the Cages, Oral Histories of North American Political Prisoners. And they're going to be joining us for a conversation on their experiences behind bars and how today's activists can prepare themselves for political repression and the possibility of incarceration. So if you've never been to one of our events before, I'll give you our standard spiel. Um, Firestorm is an almost 16-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective um, in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. Uh, we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and also the needs of marginalized communities in the South. And we're continuing to do a, a fair few uh, events virtually alongside content that we do um, uh, face to face. Uh, the virtual content I think is great for events like this where we can bring together people across borders and from a significant distance. And it's also good for folks in our community who um, have barriers to access related to health uh, or, or COVID. So um, really appreciative uh, of the ability to have these spaces. Uh, if you're interested in more virtual programming, um, I will highlight that on Monday, we're hosting Palestinian American poet, Lena Halaf Dufaha, uh, to share from her new poetry collection, Something About Living. Um, so don't miss that. You can sign up on our website. Um, and if you're interested in keeping up with future uh, programming, follow us on social media, and I'll share a link in the chat. So uh, tonight, um, note that we are using uh, a Q&A tool, excuse me, we are using Zoom's webinar um, there is a Q&A tool, but we will actually not uh, have time to, to dip into the Q&A. Uh, so um, apologies in advance, but we want to make sure we have uh, lots of time to hear from the incredible panelists who are joining us. Um, so unlike most of our events, uh, we're going to focus on hearing uh, their, uh, their remarks. So to get started, I'm going to share uh, a few quick bios for folks who are joining us. Uh, Eric King is a father, poet, author, and activist. Last December, uh, congratulations, he was released after spending nearly 10 years as a political prisoner for an active protest over the police murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. He was held in solitary confinement for years on end and has been assaulted by both guards and white supremacists. Eric has published three zines as, and his sentencing statement is included in the book, Defiance, Anarchist Statements Before Judge and Jury. Check that out for sure. Uh, Herman Bell is a former member of both the Black Panther Party and Black Liberation Army, and he was in prison for 45 years. Herman, uh, Herman was captured in New Orleans in 1973 and eventually convicted of attacks on police. He spent five years imprisoned in the federal system in the Marion Control Unit for two of those years before spending decades in various New York State maximum security prisons. While imprisoned, he was committed to community work, and he's a founding member of the Victory Gardens Project and the Certain Days Collective. He was released in 2018 after his eighth parole hearing. Welcome and thank you for being here, Herman. And we also have David Gilbert, who is a lifelong anti-imperialist who was captured and imprisoned as a result of attempted expropriation of a Brinks truck in Nyack, New York in 1981. He was sentenced to uh, 75 years to life uh, and was released from prison after nearly 40 in December of 2021. While in prison, David was a co-founder of the Certain Days Collective and has helped pioneer AIDS awareness programs that save thousands of lives in prisons across the country. Um, David has written numerous zines and three books. Uh, those are No Surrender, Love and Struggle, and Looking at the U.S. White Working Class Historically. Uh, finally, we've got Susan Rosenberg, uh, who spent 16 years in high security federal prisons for her involvement in anti-imperialist armed actions that culminated in the resistance conspiracy case of the mid-1980s. Her sentencing was commuted in, 20, uh, in, excuse me, in 2001. Um, Susan was imprisoned at the Lexington High Security Unit, the first maximum security prison for women. 
um, and uh, FCI Danbury. And she was also spent time in the DC jail system. She was involved in the May 19th communist organization, the Puerto Rican independence movement, and the successful fight for the release of long-term political prisoner, Dr. Matulu Shakur. Susan published uh, her book, An American Radical Political Prisoner in My Own Country in 2011. Um, so appreciative of y'all for being here. Oh, and I, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead since you're on screen um, and mention that we also have with us uh, Kasise Sadiki, who is an activist, filmmaker, uh, performing artist, and daughter of Black Panthers, Pamela Hanna, and longtime political prisoner, um, Kamal Sadiki. Thank you so much for being here as well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass off to Eric uh, to get us started here. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you so much. So I'd like to welcome everyone that is uh, that are joining us. Um, I would like to start this by saying that all of us collectively would like to uh, would like to dedicate this to the people of Palestine for their resistance during the uh, almost century long occupation, and for all of those that are resisting currently, including the students in the encampments all over the country, the students that are uh, rising up and standing against imperialism and against repression. We would like to send solidarity to to all of those, um, and so let let's begin. Um, as when I was uh, when I was locked up, I was locked up in 2014, and that was about the time when mass incarceration was coming down a little bit. All of you did multiple decades in prison, and a lot of that was during the height of mass incarceration. So I would like to ask you all about what your experiences were like in prison during that time in regards to your personal experiences, whether programming, interactions with officers, uh, interactions with other prisoners, and what you, what you learned about prison and maybe what you learned about society being locked up during this time period. And uh, whoever wants to start first would be great. Well, I'm going to be. Go ahead, Herman. And let David go first. <laughs> go, David. You were going to speak. Well, when I came into prison in the early 80s, we people have to remember that it's not a complete iron curtain between prison and so outside society. And people in prison are very affected by what's going on outside. And the political consciousness of the 60s and 70s hadn't completely died out. Uh, uh, and you could walk down a gallery and some cells there would be posters of El Biso Campos and Lolita Lebron and other cells would be posters of uh, Malcolm X uh, so there was a lot still a lot of political consciousness and in New York there was a tradition that go, went back to the Attica Rebellion of people work together prison it was very segregated in terms of social interaction the whites, unfortunately, still at least culturally believed in white supremacy. So those were problems. But when it was time for collective action, there was that tradition of people coming together. And there's still some Attica brothers in Auburn when I arrived, and uh, like Al Victory. And he's a white guy who's very respected, but he stood for people working together. As mass incarceration built and built and built, things changed considerably. Uh, one thing is most of the constructive programs where people could do something positive, feel good about themselves, make arts and crafts for their families. They were all, they were one by one eliminated. People became more crowded. It is partly the, just the numbers with mass incarceration, but it was also the political changes in society. And the correction system went more and more to a punishment mode. Uh, a punishment paradigm. There's nothing redeeming. It's almost like they wanted to create the brutes that they claim people were for their own political purposes. Uh, and that made it more difficult. And uh, not to, and, and uh, certain changes like, you know, the crack academic, ep epidemic and uh, the influx of certain drugs, but also when TVs came in where they were allowed to get your own TV, a lot of people who would become voracious and then deep readers 
we're more spaced out on TV, more passive. Even so, and I said outside society is a big influence. Uh, there have been prison initiatives since then, but prisoners took political leadership, and most dramatically, the Bel Pelican Bay hunger strike against solitary. Also, the Free Alabama movement in the, among Alabama prisoners. So it's not like it's all extinguished. And I'm thinking and looking as we are all here in solidarity with Palestine and self determination and liberation for Palestine. If the upsurge around Palestine is also leading to uh, renewed, re renewed politicization in prison. I heard that one of my friends from prison sent a solidarity message to the Columbia students. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Say, oh, uh, yeah, I'll let <laughs> your remark, uh, David, because the other day there was a conversation about your message to the Columbia students. And and so, like you mentioned that you sent a, a letter of, uh, of solidarity to them. Uh, you know, in a way, it's like um, we, uh, during that time you speak of, uh, were somewhat like a, a fly on the wall checking out what was going on in the world, so to speak. You know, uh, I'm a I'm a news hound, and I've just have always been. You know, and so in the joint uh, around that time, uh, we had just begun to get uh, FM radios in in the joints. You know, uh, other than that, just had AM, and that was that. You know, so um, being a news hound, you, you try to keep abreast of what's going on in the world as, as best as best you can, you know. And um, it, it, we, we talk about mass incarceration. I think that uh, 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 Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, uh, is a good piece. It's a comprehensive piece, and it speaks about... Um, a predictor of incarceration and harsh, harsher uh, sentences in in U.S. courts, you know, and that's that's just a piece of it in terms of what was going on out in the streets, uh, but the the consequences of that harsh sentencing and all of that, along with the rhetoric uh, from the various presidents, like uh, say Nixon, Reagan, um, and you could throw. Uh, Bill Clinton in there too, Bush as others, and you know their whole mantra was tough on crime and uh, you know um, just throwing them away and 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 uh, throw away the, throw them in the jail and and uh, uh, just lock them away forever. And then there were uh, some changes in in the use of uh, search search and seizure laws, you know. Uh, that also uh, contributed to uh, the increase of the prison population. Um, and and uh, then, as as David mentioned, uh, drugs uh, also contributed to the deindustrialization. And uh, you know, of course, this was we know that this was intentional. Um, and there were times, and I looked around in the prison yard. Um, and I see so many young black men and Latinos in there is as if they came into our neighborhood with a, a giant net, scooped us all up and, and just brought them to the prison and just dropped them in the yard, you know. Um, it, it was painful times too, in the sense that it seems like like the, the, this, uh, this guy named uh, Sisyphus, I believe, um, who was, sentenced to hell and his punishment was to carry a rock up a hill and, and the guy was he was devoted he he'd go up the hill but he gets so far up and he started coming coming back down you know and so in prison uh looking out and you're seeing everybody you know so many people coming in you know like well where's the front gate how do we get out of here when will things ever change you know um if somebody's, you know, speaking on behalf, um, that's just a tiny piece of uh, of um, 
what was going on uh, in some respects uh, in in the in the jails, but I can't leave out the 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 pain and suffering that that continued uh, with the people who have been in there, and some have been in there a long time. My numbers were increasing behind the wall and all that, so I, you know it, it it was it was trying time, uh, seeing that. Uh, nothing was going forward and everything basically was going backwards. And with that, I'll pass it on. Uh, Susan undoubtedly have something to add to this. Thank you. Thank you, Herman. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I was in the federal prison system. And so um, I, you know, I think it may have looked differently, but it, it, it tracks the same as what both David and Herman are, are saying. Um, in So I, I would just say, big picture, uh, when I first went into prison, which was at the end of 1984, um, the prison population in the federal prison was basically was small-ish, you know, not small, but smaller than it has become or became over the course of of uh, of all of the policies of mass incarceration and it was a third white a third latino and a third african american and you know with some other foreign international prisoners in in that in the mix and certainly that was true in the population of women um by the time i left prison which was 16 years later uh mass incarceration had become the norm. And so the population numbers really had changed. And 80% of the federal prison population of Hmong women were African-American. And you know the numbers had grown, had doubled. Um, but in that period, I think the numbers of women who had been incarcerated grew by 800%. So there was a huge, huge influx and a complete change in the population at that time. And, you know, alongside of that, there was the AIDS epidemic and crack in the 80s, the middle 80s and the late 80s. And so there were these really these massive epidemics that took place inside the population that was mass incarceration, AIDS, and crack and other and and sort of an increase in all kinds of drug use. Um, and so the whole the whole structure shifted in the period as a result of mass incarceration. And um, I think part of it was I had also been and spent almost three years in the DC jail in between different places in the federal prison system. And there, you know, you could just see how it was going to play out um, in terms of the large numbers of young Black people from D.C. who were in jail, who then got sent to the federal system. So, and I think, you know, that the, the quality of life inside um, changed. It got much more, as David put it, the punishment paradigm took over. Um, it was always there. Uh, but I think it increased enormously. And really the communities in prison in, in women's federal prisons went through, certainly from my experience, went through changes, huge changes, negative changes. The quality and content of people's lives got much worse. So, I, you know, that would be what I would say in, in terms of the specific question. Thank also, you. I would add, um, at that time, uh, inside, we were looking around and uh, for some explanation, you know, uh, for some reason that that uh, is causing the nation uh, to go in the direction that it was headed. You know, there was really no explanation. But then we have to be mindful. Mindful that um, that was also around a time where the U.S. was deindustrializing. You know, uh, they were industrialists, whatever companies, or 
running, leaving the country. He was going to Asia, Mexico, and what have you, uh, in pursuit of of cheap labor. But then that let, left a lot of idle uh, citizens, uh, you, you know, uh, in the country who really had 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 no jobs and whatnot, you know, and so. Um, my my take is that they had uh, capitalized on this fact and and started throwing them in the prisons and and uh, exploiting that situation and thus they they still make money. I will note that um, the, the 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 warden at the at Marion when I I was there in uh, 70, 74, I believe um, his name was Charlie Fenton. And and uh, when he retired as warden, he was hired by the Corrections Association of America. He became their first warden, and and that was the very first private prison that they had uh, initiated here in the country. And, and uh, then uh, more and more private private prisons started to um, spring up, and they were largely uh, uh, financed by Wall Street, as it were, you know. So. That that is uh is something that we 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 can't uh, overlook either. Yes, Susan, you were gonna. Just wanted to add that in that same period that you're talking about, what happened was the prison sent the sentences changed. Right, they got longer and longer and longer. The power to the prosecution in criminal trials got more and more consolidated. You know, that the whole apparatus during mass incarceration, not that, that there hasn't always been racial capitalism and what all of that oppression and exploitation entails, but that the 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 literally the criminal legal system shifted uh under Reagan, past Reagan, you know, where law and order it, law and order is is a catchphrase, but the structures also changed within the system to oppress and control larger and larger numbers of people. And uh, I know everyone knows this, but you know that with this country still imprisons more people than any other place. And you know it really took a step forward during during that period. And it there's still that number of people inside. The idea that mass incarceration is over. Um, I think you could debate that, but it feels the same as it, you know, in terms of numbers now. This is thank a good, you. Uh, if I can, I just want to talk yeah. about the connection between political prisoners and mass incarceration. Because in addition with the deindustrialization, the main thing that was going on is this country was stressed by the level of rebellion. And the Black Liberation Movement was the spearhead of that, and it inspired other uh, internal colonies and inspired a women's movement, environmental movement. And there's actually documentation that President Nixon said uh, it was in the diary of Haldeman, his main advisor. The problem in this country is the Blacks, and we have to do something about it without saying that's what we're doing. And they had a two-fold strategy, and it's what links political prison and mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. One was to destroy the revolutionary black movement with assassination and imprisonment, vicious. But the other was there was a, a rebellious black community. There were up, urban uprisings in hundreds of cities, and that was the war on drugs and mass incarceration. They knew making drugs illegal or prosecuting it wouldn't end drug use. They had gone through that with abolition and alcohol. It doesn't work, but it was an excuse and it's not, when you put people in prison, it's not just that there are 2 million people in cages. They have families. They have families that are missing uh, breadwinners who are missing stabilizing influences, the communities. It was a conscious strategy to, dis, to incapacitate the Black community. Okay. You're absolutely right. And thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, thank all of you for those answers. Um, so one of one of the things that impacted me greatly while I was inside was meeting so many non-political prisoners. And one of the best friends I made inside was someone named Randy Platt, and he's currently at the Federal Supermax in ADX. And the way that we bonded was because while he was in prison, the person who taught him his GED class was Dr. Shakur, Dr. Matulu Shakur. 
And that's how I was able to connect with this social prisoner was through the impact that uh, Mutulu had had on his life. And so I'd like to ask you all as political prisoners, as highly political people in general, what was the what was the connections that you made with social prisoners? Did you see it as a as a need to radicalize? Did you learn from them? Did you were you able to build strong ties and strong binds or bonds with prisoners that weren't inherently political, at least in their crimes? Um, David, we can start with you. Uh, I learned a lot from so-called social prisoners and a uh, tremendous amount. And there's tremendous solidarity. Uh, people really looked out and supported us. Uh, a, a couple of different times, prisoners who were cleaning up offices, you know, that was their job was cleaning up the offices, found a memo about how they're going to harass me or come at me and made a point of telling me about it. But I, I also learned... I mean, I had been underground for 10 years before I was busted. I had learned how to function clandestinely, but I had never been in such a totalitarian atmosphere. And a lot of the so-called social prisoners hadn't given up on organizing. I hadn't given up on ways of finding how to do things. Uh, so there was a lot of ingenuity, a lot of determination. And the other thing I learned uh, was the importance of community that even though there were different philosophies and different approaches, we we're all in the same situation. We have to work together. As to whether trying to politicize people, first, you don't come in with a big uh, pontificating to people. You have to show respect and you have to listen and you have to learn to be from people and you have to realize there'll be disagreements. Of course, I tried to talk with white prisoners about racism and actually, early on, there were a couple who did identify with the movement, one of whom had been uh, mentored by Herman Bell. Uh, but the mainstream, the mainstream among white prisoners was still white supremacists, not as overt as in the feds or in California, because whites were a minority, so they didn't want a, a race war. Uh, and I have to say, without getting into long winded, uh, most of my work didn't do that much good. I would say more that I was an example of a white guy who was respected because I had a heavy case, who didn't who didn't abide by the segregation, who worked with everybody, who admired and respected, especially the uh, ex Panthers, uh, and that we helped renew the tradition of working together for prisoners' rights. So when we started the AIDS work, we were bringing back together the most respected people in each of the communities. And that's why the prison reacted so hostily. And that's why I went through a lot of repression. But it was an example and it was also an occasion to at least attenuate the prevailing homophobia. Because we talked about if we're doing AIDS work, we have to treat everybody with respect. So those were, was more the examples of the work we did that had some impact. But I can't say, ah, here's a formula of how you talk to people who are white supremacists and win them over. I wasn't that su very successful at that. Susan? Makes sense what you say, David, um, a lot, I would say. I mean, I think the solidarity that people gave us as the political people who had heavy cases and stood for the things that they thought we stood for or that we did stand for was the best, most important part of being inside of prison, this, you know, solidarity. And and their, the solidarity that we received at, was on multiple levels. So, um, yeah, so-called social prisoners were the majority of people that I spent 16 years with. So I don't think of them quite as social prisoners. Um, I think of them as my friends who were inside and people who were imprisoned uh, for their own reasons. Um, I, I made a lot of friends inside and some of those people are still my dear, dear, dear friends. Um, I, I think you know, where we were able to have community and do work 
that's where there was an impact, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, very, very hard. Um, I also tried to, to talk with white women prisoners about race and about the issues that were going on in the prison. Um, and, you know, with some limited success, but we ended up doing a lot of educational work through the education programs there and AIDS ad advocacy and teaching courses in history, American history and black history and other other courses, English and a, a wide range of things. And in those situations, there was uh, more uh, success where we built collectivity and it was integrated. Um, so I would I would say, you know, from the very moment that I went to the DC jail, um, where what the police said about all of us in the resistance conspiracy case was that we were part of the Klan, which was their strategy to have everybody attack us inside of the DC jail. And, but they locked us all down. So of course people were like, well, who are these white people in this prison with us? And people wanted to know. And so you tell people, don't go near them. Well, of course, everybody was, you know, right at our doors talking with us from the very beginning. And that kind of solidarity and and then over time got built to respect. You know, I had a really great friend. And the first time we met in the D.C. jail, she came to my cell and she gave me an orange and a Snickers bar you know, and said, I don't believe them. And, you know, we kind of went from there. So I, I think it's, um, but again, in the feds, you get moved a lot. You go, you know, they, they really don't want anybody to be um, able to build stability to be able to organize. Uh, so, yeah, I would say that. I remember that anecdote from your book also when you're talking about the person with the orange and that really affected me because I read that while in the shoe and a jihadi bro had brought me a bag of coffee and uh -huh. he had slid it under the door for me because the guards were just on this bullshit time and so he had booked out for me so that really impacted me reading that you had gone through something very similar very similar yes all right Herman to you please I I, I remember uh probably reading Susan's book at some later point in my stay in prison, where uh, these uh, marshals was transporting her to another location. She was at MCC and they were boasting about this pretty new car, spanking brand new that they had in the basement and that she was gonna be the first one to ride up in it and whatnot, you know? So, you know, it's a ride is a ride. So they got to the basement and Susan said, she said it was a Mercedes Benz and she told them, you're not going to put me in that in that a Nazi or wagon or whatever it was. She refused to go. But of course, they just picked her up and threw it in there. But I was so, so proud of, of the response she gave them. You know, it was it was really sweet. It made my day. In fact, I, I still think about it sometimes. You know, I mean, we have to have a certain amount of levity under those circumstances. You have to find it somewhere. Otherwise, you know, um, it just makes the uh, existence in there much more harder. Um, uh, when, and, um, you know, we were like different as political prisoners simply because of the heavy case we had and all of that and all the political implications regarding that. Uh, so speaking for myself, but I, I'm sure it applies to all my comrades as well, that nobody, uh, uh knew what uh quite what to make of us or or what to expect of us you know and i'm talking about prison class as well as uh the authorities we were just there you know and and as far as i'm concerned i was good with that you know because prison is a very dangerous place there's no doubt about it and as you know they there are people in there guards and 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 uh and prisoners they will test you you know and so uh um 
I I maintain a certain posture in, inside the prison, and I, I main that, maintain that throughout. Uh, and and that is like you know I do have a heavy case, and 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 uh, you know there there were men who were reluctant to you know approach me as a normal person like everybody else you know to shoot the Willie Brobo to chat about this or that you know just be people with people. So uh, that being the case, um, I decided to become a bit more active in institutional sports such as like uh, basketball and, 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 and football and things like that. And I chose to do that. I, I, w I was not in favor of, of participating in institutional sports, but I chose to do so because that makes me a bit more uh, available to, to the rest of the guys in the joint. And they can, you know, pull up to me and say, hey, what's up? Uh, nice game or you, you, you call call that game very well or whatever, you know? And once they open up, um, then that enabled me without standing on a soapbox, right? To talk to them like I would talk to my brother or, or one of my children or whatever the case may be. And therefore I could get my message across in terms of like what is happening in the world, what is happening in the jails, what is happening in interpersonal relationships. So um, yeah. I, I, for the most part, uh, we were well received uh, by the prison population uh, in the various joints that we were in. And as Susan pointed out, David knows as well, and as you do, they moved us around a lot. And so they didn't want us to maintain a lasting relationship uh, with with the uh, with the class, prison class. So uh, you know, from joint to joint, it kind of like built up. You you just people look to you, they think of you, and 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 they respect you. And but of course, they expect of you to comport yourself in such a way that you don't disappoint them. Because if you disappoint them, then they start hating you, and then they start disrespecting you, and it goes off into other things. I'll leave it there for now. You want to? Well, I, I just want to add a comment from being in the same system as Herman. His a skill as a quarterback was legendary <laughs> throughout New York. But in, in, more importantly, I, I mentioned he mentored this one white guy who became pretty conscious. You don't know, and you probably don't know, Herman, how many, mainly young Black prisoners, but other people too, came up to me and said, I was mentored by Herman Bell. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. That that was widespread. That's widespread. People were proud of that. And they were and in the process becoming politically conscious, too. Uh, Herman, I'd like to ask you, because you did both state and federal time, was there a difference between how you were received in like New York State or Louisiana versus how you were received at Marion? Um, New York State is a state prison, and the state prisons especially in New York state, uh, is different than the prison system in the feds. Uh, in some ways, the, the feds is a bit more dangerous in a sense. You know, I've, I've saw a lot of bodies, a, lot, a number of people being bodied in the fed system. And you've been there, so you, you know, it's a very dangerous place. And, and, and um, but at the time that I was, in the feds, um, Susan pointed it out, but, but you know, in regards to mass incarceration, like when she she had uh, had uh, made parole, but but um, y you know, when I the time that I was in the federal system, the f the system wasn't as large as 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 it it grew to be. Um, I think they had uh, ooh, maybe eight ten thousand federal prisoners. If if that you know, it's very small. Now, uh, and and most of the prison prisoners in the Fed system were like professional uh, crooks or whatever you may want to call them, you know. But they were mostly professional. They hung paper. Yes, they robbed banks. Uh, I, I ran into a few of the guys who was in the. Um, you remember the movie The French Connection? Um, I ran into a few, 
people says there's a variety of colorful people, but they're a different kind of uh, of 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 a uh, of, of prison class. Now, for example, in Washington D.C., they have no federal, they have no state uh, prison system. They send all of their prisoners to the federal system, you know. And and uh, I have happened to meet some of the guys out of the, out of the D.C. area, and I had never run across human beings like that, you know, in a prison system. They call them the DC boys. I've never seen a bunch of men that was so uh, uh, so tight, you know, so close knitted. And 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 uh, even the guards had to pull back and give them that, that amount of respect. But here, uh, the system started changing just as, uh, I started leaving out in 79, going, going into the, the state. And that was because of the, of the drugs epidemic that was going on. And that was because the, 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 uh, the state, the federal laws had started changing and, and, and uh, the sentencing laws were changing such that like a lot more people were coming in and also they were also filtered into the federal system. So, so that like now I, I have no idea what the numbers uh, but it's it probably troubled since I, I was in that system, you know. So there's a difference in New York State. Uh, it, it's it, it's a, it's a bit it's a bit different. All right, thank you. Um, so one of the reasons why me and Josh rushed to get out rattling the cages is that people people grow old, and we've lost a lot of fighters recently. And we still have a lot inside. We still have Jaleel. We still have Mr. Siddiqui. We still have Leonard. Um, so I'd like to give each of you a chance, if you'd like, to speak about comrades you lost inside or brothers and sisters we might still have inside. If you'd like to talk about any memories you have or any any interesting anecdotes you'd like to share, just to honor those that uh, that we've lost or that are still still locked down. Herman, you're up. So if you want to go first, well, <laughs> yeah. Well, you mentioned Leonard, uh, and then also there, there's Veranza. I spent time with Veranza in uh, in Atlanta, but um, I, I met Leonard at, at Marion. He had just been uh, deported from uh, Canada, uh, which where he was he was uh, captured, and uh, they dropped him off at Marion. You know, and I happen to also be there with uh, Rafael Cancel Miranda, one of the uh, wow. Puerto Rican nationalists. You know, which which was it was cool. I mean, like <laughs> I had good company there; it was fine. Uh, and you know, I had heard a lot about Leonard, but I wanted to check Leonard out as a person. You know, see what <laughs> happened. You know, like what kind of dude he was, and all of that. You know. So uh, that was quite interesting, and, and um, so we we spent time together in the yard, um, in the blocks, uh, whatever you know. Uh, we had our political discussions uh, along with Raphael. So it really was a fun time, a special time for me because I got got the opportunities to to hang with those guys for a minute. Um, and uh, I spent a bit of time in um, in Atlanta, which is where. Uh, Veranza was there and and um Atlanta USP? Yeah, at USP. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it was, it was not long after I was there that uh, the Mariel boat people, uh Fidel was kind enough to send them empty his jails and send them over to the US of A. And they discovered that it was a lot of miscreants and bad, bad <laughs> people who was committing all kinds of crimes in Florida and what have you, you know, so they told Fidel, hey, hey, <laughs> take them back. You know, Fidel said, no, 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 ain't nothing happening. So they didn't they didn't know what to do with them. So they brought him to a lot, a lot of them, they brought him to Atlanta and housed them there and all of that, you know. And uh, uh, it, it was it was a pleasant time there in Atlanta, hanging with Veranza and a few other brothers there. Um, and and uh, uh, back to Leonard. Leonard uh, fancied himself as a as as an artist. He was learning to draw. You know, <laughs> you know. And I thought it was quite amusing, right? So fast forward this. Um, 
in, in, in uh, our calendar certain days, you know. One day I looked up and I saw this this uh, this uh, picture of a of a horse, and and it was credited to Leonard. I said, and it and the horse looked good. I said, oh wow, he's really really up to his game, right? That's so cool, you know. Um, you know, uh, I, my hope is that we all we get out, and and uh, that has not been the case, you know. Uh, some of us have come out, some of us remain in there and and that's very hurtful so that's what i could share in so far as like those who have come across thank you for that susan would you like to go uh sure um well just to to say i think uh, when marilyn buck and dr matul shakur were on trial in new york a number of us uh, who were political prisoners uh, were called to New York to possibly testify in their trial, but we were called there also to do work on uh, some of the motions that they were working on for their case. The political prisoner offense exception was a paper. David, I know you remember. Um, and Geronimo Pratt was there. Uh, and um, he was one of the people who worked on that. And, you know, he passed, he got out, which was a great victory, but he passed not that long after, a couple of years after he, he got out. Um, and there, I mean, there's so many. And one of the things I was so struck by in your book in Rattling, Rattling the Cages was the breadth of people that you include and how many people who are political from across different movements in so many different ways who have been incarcerated. And um, so there's just a really a, so many people and people that we don't mention anymore. And I've been thinking about Geronimo uh, in, in the context of this past year, it's not even a year uh, that um, so many of the black political prisoners have passed away. And I I spent the last decade working on Dr. Shakur's case um, and has, was an associate and a, a comrade of his for, for 45 years. Um, and- Wow. Uh, yeah, a long time. And, you know, his, his fight to get out his uh, fight to uh, be heard politically, uh, I think, was really uh, intertwined with the battle for his release. Uh, you know, we're at a place where people are getting compassionate release uh, if 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 they get that. And I know I'm sure Cassise is going to talk about that also. But um, that, you know. At the at the edge of the door, kick them out. Um, you know at what it means for people to be released so that they can die on the outside. And and while that's better than dying on the inside, um, you know it's a it's a it's a mixed it's a mixed victory it, or it's a mixed success at fighting the state in that particular way. Um, so I think Dr. Shakur and you know, Sekou Odinga, and there are others, many others. So I, I, I think we need to remember them all, you know, yes. the known and the lesser known, um, you know, thinking about Marilyn Buck and Marilyn Buck getting out. And, you know, I know I see your shirt, Eric. Um, I love that shirt. It's a really beautiful picture of Marilyn. It's so um, nice. Yeah, it is. You know, but it's just numbers of people who whose lives I think is important to know, important for the movement now to know and to understand some of those people that we are, are not front of mind anymore, understandably, because time and change happens and there's a whole new, multiple new generations. Um, but I, I feel... I feel very, you know, very sad about who who's who we've lost in the last 
couple of years around this. These were giants in the revolutionary movement. And, um, you know, they will always, for me, be, you know, in the present. They are our giants, for sure. Uh, David, would you go, please? Sure. First of all, in New York, I mean, we, as Susan just said, we've lost so many really wonderful people who have a lot to contribute and did contribute from prison, but it would be great if they could uh, continue to have dialogue with the younger generation because we learn from each other. In many of the people, you know, as we age, it's sort of natural that we're going to lose some comrades physically. We keep what they taught us or what they did or what lives on after them. But prison takes a tremendous toll too. Uh, it's poor medical care, it's poor diet, it's high stress. All of those things shorten people's lives. In New York State, I had the honor and, and learned tremendous amount from doing time with several of the ex-Panthers, ex-BLA. Herman and I were together for a bit of time. They would break things up and at the end they spread us all out. And so many beautiful, courageous, brilliant brothers. Some people don't even, aren't even well known, Ja Teddy Heath. Uh, yeah. But, uh, and of course, my co-defendant and dear friend, Crazy Balagoon. And uh, Noah Washington, brilliant, very spiritual brother. Uh, Seth Hayes, Robert Seth Hayes. Those, these are people I did time with and had developed friendships with. There are other people like Bashir Hamid and uh, I, I, and I'm not even, I should have made a list of the names, but I want to talk briefly about Sekou Odinga, who didn't Please. find prison, who got out and did great work once he got out after doing 30 some years. But I want to talk about him because uh, he just joined the ancestors uh, three months ago. Uh, a very, and this wasn't prison healthcare, it was this very sudden illness, which he fought bravely, but succumbed to. And Sekou was also, we were co-defendants in our case, and he was charged with playing a major role in breaking Asada Shakur out of prison. Uh, so it just if I can just talk about him, to, to me, he is probably the most outstanding example of steadfastness that I know of. And when I say steadfast, I don't mean someone who's rigid or dogmatic and driven that way. Someone who has a deep love for his people and through that, through all oppressed people. He was part of the famous Panther 21 case in 69. But when the police came to arrest him, he jumped out of a four story window and uh, next time he was cited was in Algeria and how he got to Algeria was pretty dramatic too. But even though he was safe in Algeria, he came back to the United States to be underground to uh, continue the struggle for liberation here. He wasn't on Brinks, the, the case where I was busted, but Brinks led to a really collapse of a lot of security networks and he was, arrested soon thereafter. At the same time, MTRE Shabaka Sundiata was killed by the police. Sekou walked into the police station in perfect health, came out to three months in the hospital uh, and part of it in intensive care. And it wasn't just beatings. There's a difference between beatings and torture. Torture is more scientific to break people down. He was tortured and he didn't break. And when we got together, Kwesi and Sekou and me, you know, in those situations, people can recriminate and this fool did this and Sekou wasn't on Brinks and he was jammed up for life because of Brinks. None of that is for revolutionaries. We know that there are risks. We analyze mistakes, but we don't recriminate against other people. Uh, so when he came out after 30 some years in prison, he went right right to political work. He helped with Jaleel and to form the In the Spirit of Mandela, which is a great 
program to raise consciousness about political prisoners, but also to renew the charge of genocide against the United States, genocide against new African people. So he's, he's, an, he's an example. I want to say two other things about political prisoners, both who died, yeah. if I can quickly. One is when I say the the, the well, I, well, I'll, I'll hold, I'll hold. It will come up in another question. Uh, Can I well, say something? Because I, I, I know we're about to bring you in. Oh, because <laughs> I wanted, I, I wanted to say something. I mean, I want to talk about my father, but. I think also the impact of losing so many of our political prisoners. And like, for me, I have to share that information with my father, which is very hard because like, even talking about Baba Sekou Odinga, like I recently saw him, like he supported my father's campaign and I saw him back in March and spoke on a panel with him and I have so many photographs of him, you know, so, um, the impact of his health and him just his relationship, his his wife's um De Kui is like my aunt, you know. So these relationships that I have, you know, our political prisoners are like my aunts and uncles. So, you know, it's 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 hard to be the voice of like to share that information. You know, it's like when you have to share with someone who is locked like locked up like my dad and give him updates. You know, and like when I had to share with him that Sekou passed away, it was like my father broke down and I've never heard my father break down before, you know, and he was very apologetic about it. But that's that's a lot, you know, um, to have to share that information, you know, so. But thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, so exactly. I, I'd like to I wanted to add that in we're talking about the comrades who passed away in prison, people say the worst thing, I don't want to die in prison, which is completely understandable. You want to be among loved ones. But even more important is to have lived our lives with integrity. And people like Noah and people like Ja and people like Crazy lived their lives with integrity. And there's a legacy there that can be valuable to future generations. So I would like to remind our listeners that even though political prisoners, we hold we hold these people up as fighters and warriors, like political prisoners are still humans and still have hearts and still develop strong personal relationships with each other and with others. And when we lose one another, it still hurts. It hurts bad. Um, and those holes are, are hard to mend. Um, and so why, while we have you here, um, I'd like to have you uh, introduce yourself, uh, Casey, say, um, talk about your father for a little bit and what we got going on. And then we have one question after that, once uh, after we speak about your father for a little bit that I'd like to uh, ask the panelists. So the floor is yours, please. Well, thank you. It's good to see everybody. Um, David, my mother has spoken so much about you too. My mother, Pamela Hanna. Um, and hi, everyone. Hi, Susan. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I just want to say that, you know, there was a time when I would talk about my father and um, and I felt alone. Um, you know, I'm his daughter. I've had this incredible relationship with my father. I've I've experienced my father in prison when I was a baby. I have letters from him as a as a baby. Um, I've experienced my father come out of prison. I've experienced that remarkable moment of seeing him come home. And then I've experienced him going back into prison and having to be a woman and go and experience him going into prison for a second time and have had to um, have my children, um, he has grandchildren to um, um, go through that. that um, so I want to say that for me to come on this panel today and actually talk about my father's, the international campaign to free Kamal Siddiqui. That is progress. That's progress because there was a time that I had didn't, we didn't have a campaign for him. And so I have taken this energy, this emotion that I have from my father and I'm putting it, putting it and channeling it into his campaign. And um, the, we have so much support, you know, um, 
you know, my father's in Augusta State Medical Prison, and he has um, he's had several wounds. Um, he has sarcoidosis. You know, he had hepatitis. You know, um, and even with that, he's a warrior. We know that. Um, my father's incredible. He's my hero. Um, but I am, you know, I'm always his voice because my father's also very shy. Um, so even with this incredible campaign that we have for him, he still doesn't like to ask, like he doesn't like to talk about what's going on sometimes. And that's why I'm like, I, I only get to communicate with him through JPay. Um, and so when he sends me a message, I'm like, I need to know exactly what's happening because we have this campaign for you. And we have um, we have a legal we have legal and medical team committee. We have outreach. You know, we're here to educate people so that they do know who you are. This is what I tell my father. Um, so you know, right now we're focused on um, this parole packet. That even to say that, like again, my father went back into prison in two thousand two, and I never thought we could even talk about him coming home. That wasn't something I could even think about it before because I was like, just like too much. But now with this, with our um, campaign, we're we're focusing on getting these letters out to um, my meeting with council members and you know just letters from family um, to bring bring him home, and he's gonna come home and. I'm gonna film that. I'm a filmmaker too, so I'm gonna. That's gonna be an incredible time for me. But um, and I'm channeling that. I know he's gonna come home. Um, and so what we ask is for support. You know, I, I always think about the support right now. That when he does come home, and like you, Herman, you know that. Like you know, you're talking about housing and just the basic step basic needs of a person when they come home with you know in your family and everything um and um so again we're pushing for the for the parole packet and um getting these letters out um my father recently um i spoke with him oh i didn't speak with him but he emailed me and he said that his sarcoidosis was acting up and that was something that hasn't like he hasn't experienced that kind of pain in a while. So um, so I'm gonna see him hopefully soon in May. Um, again, he has the legal team um, in Atlanta to go visit him, which is, it's progress, you know? Um, I know I, I have an email, I have how people can support, um, go on freakkamal.com and um, Laura, I think hi Lord um, had given me an uh, an email too. I don't know if I could put it. Can I put it in the chat and will everyone see it or? Uh, how? Because I know this is a webinar. If you drop it in the chat, I'll make sure it gets to everybody. Okay, perfect. Um, put it in there. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, again, we're making progress, and I know. I know what I, I know what prison is like, not that I've been on inside, but having someone that I love, I know that it's 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 heavy. And so any time that I get to see my father is just a remarkable time. We have, you know, even if it's it's two hours, you know, people take that for granted. If it's two hours, it's a special two hours, you know, the letters that we get to write each other, it's it's special. Um, and I also, I do political work. When I say political work, like I, I, I'm i an artist, but I needed to understand the system. I needed to understand policy. And so I, the kind of work that I do, even my day work as um, working with immig immigration, working in policy, I, I'm in Harlem, you may hear those horns. Um, I needed to understand what, what the system, you know, having those interactions and the strategic plans and what what needs to be done to really build a campaign. Um, and again, using my knowledge, using the, the the connections that I have with people, with everyone, the support, um, using that, not just feeling like I am hopeless, but as his daughter, but feeling like I can really advocate for my father. Um, that's so important for me. So 
Um, Thank you. I think that's all I have to say <laughs> for now. Thank, I, I would like to uh, I would like to remind also our listeners that like people political prisoners have families. It's not just us that are inside. It's our it's our families, and they need help too. It's not just support so and so prisoner. Like let's support their families also. Let's support their children, their loved ones, their support teams. Like. Let's raise up our communities instead of just individuals as well. Um, so we've got one question left uh, and we've got about 20 minutes left, give or take for the, for the panelists. And it's, it's a question for the abolitionist movement. It's, it's what do you see in the abolitionist movement? What do you see that we're doing well and what needs to be done? There's a lot that needs to be done. We haven't won. Um, so what would you say to those those people fighting to to change this world what message would you say that they're doing well or what would you say we need to work on david if you'd go first well first of all my salute and solidarity to the abolitionist movement and thanks for the courage and the fortitude and the persistence to make it a major issue i like the concept of abolition because it says the whole system is wrong and I'm not close enough in to sort of make detailed suggestions. Two things from feedback I get. I mean, I'm close enough into the day-to-day -day work. Uh, I think, and I think people learn this from the Pelican Bay strike. We don't want to be dogmatic against reforms. Reforms mean a lot to prisoners. We want to understand reforms that illustrate the system is corrupt and wrong and that push forward to, to more change and to, to, challenge the whole system. Uh, and, and I think we have to point out how the society, the people in power are the real criminals and they're de generating the real damage. Uh, and the last thing which I know is happening now is internationalism is always important and especially with Palestine right now. Hey, thank you. Uh, Susan, if there's anything you'd like to say to the abolitionists out there. Um. Well, thank you. Yes, I think that abolition has become a movement with multiple elements and factors and people and forces is a is a victory also, you know, or a success of what was an idea. Well, had been a movement in the Civil War, but then you know, for a long time was not a word that people used uh, to describe systems or demands. Um, I know that I got out of prison before uh, Angela Davis wrote the book um, about, you know, abolishing prisons. Um, she published that in 2003. And you know, I came out of prison being a prison abolitionist. Um, but I think now, over the last period, that term has correctly, or in, you know, has in fact become a much broader um, definition than just about prisons. I shouldn't say just, but in terms of prisons, and um, I think you know that's really important. And I, I, I guess I see a link between the fight about prisons and against mass incarceration and around um, exposing what the state and the power of the state through all of its mechanisms um, has done and been. And it isn't just prisons, it's more than prisons for sure. It's police, it's policing. It's, you know, we haven't talked about that at all, but um, so I, I think it's a very important and positive, wonderful thing that it has now become, uh, have much broader meaning. I don't, like David, I don't have, I'm not, you know, I'm mostly I teach about prisons and do activism in relationship to political prisoners, but I'm not in like some abolitionist areas of work. Um, so I, I don't, I, I don't have a critique of the abolitionist movement or things I have want to say you should or shouldn't be doing. I do I do think that all movements need to listen to the people that are in them. <laughs> and um, I think that seems, you know, 
really important to me in terms of, of where the direction is. And I agree with David that internationalism um, has really is really a, a key factor. I guess the thing, the one other thing we haven't really talked about or touched on is women and the role of feminism and the role of women's leadership and the role of black women's leadership and the need to integrate that. And I don't mean integrate from the point of view of integration, but the need to put together and recognize that that leadership of mass movements that is going on across the US is crucial. And all the movements have to take that leadership and learn from it and, and move forward with it, you know? So I, I really, I feel like that's a whole different discussion, but would be great to have because um, without it, we can't win. You know, I really think it's that, 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 uh, clear so that's that's not so specific but my answer um herman could you would you please i'll be brief <laughs> <laughs> as both david and susan have said that um you know I, I too am not as close to the abolitionist movement um but i am i am aware of it uh i i strongly support it and uh, I see that there has been an uptick in, in general overall support of it. Uh, I, I have no, no critique of it, uh, but uh, I, you know, it, it largely will, will develop uh, even more uh, support and, and uh, 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 awareness based upon the kind of education that goes out about prison and uh, prison ab abolition. Um, uh, to me, uh, you know, it's not unlike uh, defunding the police. You know, it's it's a term that has been misunderstood and, and used for various purposes and whatnot. But uh, it's it's significant, and, and uh, uh, the more that people become aware of the need to defund the police, the more the people become aware of the abolition of prisons. Uh, in terms of education, I, I think that that'll that'll uh, push us much fur further along until we can actually uh, tear those walls down. Uh, but it it won't happen overnight, and. and uh, uh, it's just something that we should never lose sight of and, and, and should all, always throw out strong support in its abolition. But in addition to that, the future is for the young people, you know, and, and uh, so we as people who've been out there for a while, uh, uh, we, 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 we don't and shouldn't take the, 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 the role of being one who has total knowledge of how to go forward and, and what, how to how to you know engage the op opposing uh, of forces it's the young people it's it's their time and 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 uh they uh, i think that they're doing pretty well in terms of uh of taking up of that that challenge and going going forward so uh, that's as i said i'd be brief uh and that's all i have to say just now i mean when i was in greece uh, I was there for the austerity protests uh, about 14 years ago, and there was anarchist banners everywhere, and they all said, you can't fool the youth. The youth will carry the day. Uh, and that's what you just reminded me of. Yeah. Um, so we've got, a, uh, we've got a few minutes left. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to ask all of you if, uh, if you have any projects going on, if you want to talk about them, talk about what you're working with, what you're working on, if there's anything dear to your hearts that you just want to put out there. Just give that time and space to let you uh, let you talk about whatever you've got going on or feel feel as valuable and would like to say. And Herman, we got you on the screen, so if you'd like to go first, I'm uh, currently part time employed by the Alliance of Families for Justice, and within that um, group, uh, we have a, a project called Youth Empowerment, uh, and, and uh, it's it's about teaching young people uh, leadership skills, 
and and so I'm working with them. Um, and that's that's uh, it's uh, it's quite a an experience in that like uh, to to work with people so young. You know, we're talking folks like 14, 15, 25. Yeah. And, and, and the things that they say, the things that that uh, you hear from them, uh, it's kind of surprising because uh, it just makes me realize that uh, how, how, how young I was and how young they are. And, and, and uh, it's you think that they would know certain things as a given, but in fact, given what they say, you you realize that that's not so you know like a lot of work has 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 to be done there uh i beyond that uh um i'm looking towards uh, trying to get involved with videos such a, such that we uh will be able to tell our own stories in our own voice uh and that's something that um is is uh is a work in progress it it requires a lot of gathering of different pieces to put it together. And I'm also uh, writing uh, my autobiography. Yes. Uh, so um, I should be done with my part of it in another three to four months. So that's about all I'm doing just now. I would also like to remind our listeners that I believe it was six years ago today, Herman was freed from prison. So today is a, uh, a really wonderful, wonderful anniversary and celebration for that. Uh, yeah, uh, Susan. You. If you have anything going on, or you like to talk about any projects you're working on, I, I'd love for you to share, please. Well, I, you know, I guess taking this opportunity just to say that um, there are all these political prisoner campaigns that are going on, and um, they're they're individual, but they're also part of collectivity. They're collective. You know, they're they're of a piece and um, what Cassise was talking about, about her dad, um, we we're talking about Leonard earlier. Um, there's this struggle going on about Mumia, Mumia Abu-Jamal turned 70 this week uh, and he's he's still in and you know, the legal options are closing as time goes on. And, you know, so I think then there's, you know, Veronza Bowers, there's, all of the list uh, of people that still are inside. You know, sometimes I think about like I've been out longer than I was in, and uh, and then I think of people who are still in who were in when I was in, and it's almost it's it's almost unfathomable to me to 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 uh, feel their suffering from this incredible lengthy amount of time people are doing in horrible fascistic totalitarian u.s prisons um and so i you know for me i think that you know leave no comrade behind um and to the best that we can make that true that's what a lot of us are still doing um and i think trying to link those cases where there's mass movement uh, where there can be then added support and a, a linkage between political prisoners and these other social movements because we need large numbers of people to to free our our people um and i think you know there are people doing that more and more um so I would say, you know, I'm not right this second working on a specific campaign, but I have been for years and, you know, we'll figure that out. Um, and I, I think also I've been really impacted by this generational shift that's going on and that David talked about and Herman talked about. And I also experience as an elder in our movement. Um, and so I, I, I think I want to really write about the last couple of years of my experience in supporting both the freedom of Dr. Shakur and the you know, struggle that Sekou Odinga waged in the last part of his life, which was, as David said, um, just a heroic 
a heroic battle to continue to participate in a revolutionary manner in his own life. And we don't, you know, we don't see that that much in our society. This is not who we get exposed to. So I feel like that's part of what, you know, and as a white person fighting white supremacy within those situations, what what can I bring to the moment now? And so I sort of that's my challenge to myself in this period. So Thank that's you. that's what I would say. Before I move on to David, I I, I don't want to make you three uncomfortable, but I hope you know like how important the youth still value you. Even though like I don't know if I'm considered the youth, but all three of you were so motivational, at least in my life and my comrades' lives. When I was 17, I had a Kuwaiti Balagoon uh, Appreciation Society, and our whole job was going around letting air out of the tires of cop cars. Uh, we were just young anarchists trying to rebel. Um, and then all of your books, at least like Susan David, uh, like your guys' books are still circulating. People still text me about, where can I get this? Where can I read that? So I hope all of you understand the, the impact that you have on like the youth still today um, and just how valuable your actions, words, and thoughts are to all of us. Um, so David, please, if you have anything going on, anything you wanted to talk yeah. about, please share. I want to say that in, in it, when people read Rattling the Cages, there are a lot of different experiences in different situations. Every single person talks about how important outside support was. Yeah. And it was crucial to me to be able to not just survive and counter repression, but to actually get to a point where I could do some useful work, some productive work. So outside support is crucial. But to get to to get to what you were saying, Eric, it goes two ways. Political prisoners have a lot to offer. They're not just individuals that deserve support. There's a lot of experience that people can learn from, not mimic, but to learn from. But it goes two ways. Polit as political prisoners, people have a responsibility to help pass on the lessons. And that's both to affirm what we stand for, to not cave under the pressure or give up our principles. And everybody in this book did a good job, but also to analyze our mistakes so that people don't re repeat those mistakes. So I just wanted to talk about that two-way process. In terms of political work now, I have to say, I haven't caught my stride. I'm not doing very much. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, some dialogues with people working in mass incarceration on, on how to bring in internationalism. The group that I was closest to is RAP, Release Aging People in Prison. And it's a good example of the synergy between against mass incarceration and political prisoner work. It was started by two released political prisoners, Kathy Boudin, Laura Whitehorn. And the third person was a comrade of mine who were in prison struggles, for, uh, Mujahid Fareed. Uh, but part of the concept was that this would be a route to get at least some of the political prisoners out. But it was also a way to show how cruel and unusual the prison system is. Uh, and they're an organization that isn't just an NGO, isn't an NGO or living on grants, they're out organizing. Since I've moved from New York, I'm not working as closely. I moved out west to be with my family, which is wonderful. But one advantage to being free from prison, where none of us are completely free with being out of prison, is I've been able to go on a number of free Palestine demonstrations. And that's been okay. Exciting. Okay. So I'll leave it there. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, while I have people here, I would like to shout out uh, those in ADX, those in control units those in supermax prisons um please folks please include them in your support please include them in your your letter writing your campaigns your book sendings let's not forget those that don't get to see sunlight um i'd like to thank everyone i would like to thank all the panelists because thank you for speaking about your father um this has been a real blessing and honor for me to get to talk with all three of you and get to share your experiences with you so thank you so much and thank you liberty at firestorm for having us this is a real honor. Thank you. And thank you, Eric, for coming out. Thank you, Eric, really. Yeah, they're forceful despite all the difficulties in prison and for organizing this. Yes. Yes, thank I you. I love you all so much.
real. So thank yeah. you. Yes. Thanks to all of you. I also want to shout out our friends at AK Press who put together this incredible volume, oh, yeah. which I hope folks will pick up. Um, and also Josh Davidson, who did a lot of behind the scene work to make the book and tonight happen. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, Y'all are incredible. Person. It's been such a pleasure tonight. I wish we could spend more time together, um, but it was a real gift to be here tonight. Thank, thank you, you thank John. You, thank you. Bye-bye. Good evening. Stay safe, folks. Bye-bye. Thank you.